Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our series of lectures on ethical implication of AI. My name is Roberto Zicari. I'm uh, particularly glad to introduce you the lecture of today. The topic is Trustworthy AI, a Human-Centered Perspective. Our speaker is Dr. Christopher Burr. Uh, before I give uh, Christopher the floor, a couple of information for some of you that are new. I, I'm seeing in the chat that uh, there are a number of people that are attending this lecture for the first time. We, you can ask questions via the chat. I will be moderating the chat, so uh, depending on when Christopher would like to accept questions, either at the end or in the middle, I will then read your uh, questions and Christopher will have an uh, opportunity to answer. His presentation is really a bridge between a number of things we've seen until now. It's really putting together various aspects that are from theoretical framework down to practical implementation. Christopher, uh, welcome to our lecture and the floor is on you. Thank you very much, Roberto. And thank you also to Todor as well, um, to you both for helping organize such a fantastic series of lectures and for inviting so many great speakers. I've in fact had the um, pleasure and privilege of listening to many of the lectures myself and it's great to be able to build on the foundation that the other speakers have laid for me. Um, so I very much see this lecture as sort of expanding and extending upon the previous lecture series. Hopefully many of you have listened to the first, um, uh, sorry, the preceding lectures, but for those of you who haven't, um, I will try to endeavor to ensure that what I discuss presumes as little prior knowledge as possible. Um, but thank you also to all the participants for joining. Um, a little bit about myself and the Turing just before I begin the lecture in earnest. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Alan Turing is the, the National Institute for AI and Data Science in the United Kingdom. Within the Turing, we have many different researchers covering um, areas such as computer science, data science, and artificial intelligence. Uh, I sit within the public policy program, and as Roberto says, the work that we do, the research that we do, is very much a bridge. We work both with academic organizations, um, we have various universities that comprise the Unturing Institute, but we also work with public sector organizations. And I'll be saying a little bit more about that work um, throughout the talk today. Um, however, because we are very much a multidisciplinary institute, and I think the, the flavor of these lectures has also been very multidisciplinary, there is an opportunity for me to focus the talk um, on different aspects that are most interesting to the participants. So borrowing from something that Raphael Calvo did in one of his lectures, I'd like to start with the following, and that's to request everybody who goes to menti.com, adds the following code, and then answers the question about what their disciplinary background is. For those of you unfamiliar with menti.com, it does not require any registration, and your answers are anonymous. Um, so before I begin the, the, the talk, it would just be very helpful for me to know um, the sort of the makeup of the participants. So hopefully now if I click on to um, new share, I can switch my screen over to the, the next desktop. And so everybody should now be able to see the results trickling in. Um, if someone actually could pop into the chat to make the, to tell me whether or not my screen sharing has switched over and everybody can see the results, that'd be helpful. It shows, thank you, Alina. Brilliant. So I just give everybody a couple of minutes just to, uh, to put this in. I presume that the makeup will be very similar to what it was for Rafael Calvo's, assuming that people are sort of um, following the general series of talks, but Ah, there are quite a few other. Maybe I should have made a more fine-grained uh, set of options. Um, if anybody from the other category wishes to say, share what discipline they are from, that could also be quite helpful. Any of the six people who have said other. 
education, computational neuroscience, fantastic. And I'll be talking a little bit about some cognitive and behavioral science towards the end of the lecture, so hopefully there'll be some stuff. And life science is great. I'll just give it another couple of uh, seconds. Ethics and compliance. I chose public policy and behavioral science, but I'm more ICT policy. Great. Well, anybody who's from policy will hopefully find much of what I have to say of interest. Um, I can see there's 56 participants, but I don't want to spend too much time focusing on this. So it looks like we have a broad range of people from philosophy, computer science, public policy, and other, which is good because the three primary interests of mine are very much philosophy and ethics, computer science and engineering, and indeed public policy. So it does seem like what I have prepared for you all will be well received, I hope. Okay, I'm just going to switch back over to the... Um, the main, main presentation, and we will crack on with the presentation. Barely two seconds. I am trying to run two different screens so I can see my notes here, and I am just trying to get up to the other screen. Okay, can everybody still, still hopefully everybody can see the, the screen still. If there's any problems, please, uh, Roberto, jump in and let me know. I can't see the chat anymore. Okay, so um, let's begin. I think it's important when discussing trustworthy AI to note a couple of things about the general framing of the conversation. And many may think that the importance of trustworthy AI comes from mitigating the various risks associated with algorithmic systems, including artificial intelligence. Um, many people may be familiar with uh, news reports such as the uh, use of the compass algorithm in criminal justice over in the US that when evaluated by journalists and ProPublica found um, evidence of algorithmic discrimination between um, people of color and white people regarding the disparate rates of recidivism in which the algorithm expected people to, to uh, re-offend. And of course, there are other risks associated with um, artificial intelligence, not merely discrimination, but also the fact that uh, the benefits of artificial intelligence may be um, unfairly uh, distributed across different parts of the globe and within different communities, creating what some refer to as the digital divide. The idea that AI um, may not be accessible to all, whether or not for reasons of technical literacy or maybe due to social inequities in people's access. And while I do not want to downplay these risks, they are of course incredibly important and motivate much of what I will have to say in today's lecture. I think it is also important to acknowledge the fact that there are of course opportunities. And the reason for this is that we can be motivated by both risks and opportunities. And therefore, when we think about what AI can bring, it is important to note that artificial intelligence may have many opportunities in, um, at a global level for improving sustainable development, not merely in say smart cities, but also for climate change in general. And so when we think about, and of course, sorry, we also heard in, I think, Thomas's talk about the impact that AI may have on healthcare and how it may help us develop new forms of precision medicine, which may indeed help reduce some of the inequities in terms of health inequities that um, other people may refer to as risks. The reason I think this is important, as you'll see when we discuss eth ethics and policy, is that sometimes the role of ethical values, principles, and policy and governance is often treated as a form of compliance, as a sort of a form of red tape or bureaucratic nightmare that has to be navigated. But I think this is wrong-headed, and I think it's important that we understand the role that ethical principles, policy and governance, and of course, technical guidance as playing a steering wheel that guides us towards realizing these opportunities. Because artificial intelligence does have massive potential to um, improve human and social well-being. And therefore, it would be deeply irresponsible of us to waste these opportunities purely because we have not thought about the role that trust plays in the uptake and acceptance of such technologies. So with this general framing and motivation in mind, here's a brief outline of what I'll be discussing today. There are four main sections to this lecture. I'll start by setting some context where I will discuss 
um, some of the ethical principles that have been proposed, as well as the policy and governance frameworks that these ethical values and principles inform, as well as the technical guidance which helps operationalize and put into practice the principles and guidance that has been developed. Once this context has been uh, put in place, I will then turn to a more critical perspective and start looking at how to evaluate these types of frameworks that have been put forward as a way of developing trustworthy AI. And the purpose of this is to ask whether the current approach is likely to achieve its purported goal of developing systems that are trustworthy and whether in fact this is even the right goal to pursue. Next, we'll look at the role that trust and human-computer interaction plays in the general debates around trustworthy AI. For those of you who, do not, uh, who may not be familiar with HCI, this refers to human-computer interaction, which is a multidisciplinary field of research that studies the design and use of computer technology and focuses on the interface between humans, i.e. users, and computers. And it is often situated at the intersection of a number of disciplines, including computer science, behavioral sciences, um, computer science and engineering, um, and several other fields of study, including philosophy, ethics, and policy. So it's good that we've got such a nice um, representation in the audience. And then finally, we'll end with a more um, speculative proposal about how I think trustworthy AI as this multidisciplinary research program should um, move forward. And then of course there will be time for Q&A. I should also point out that um, around the time, uh, once we finish with the context section, I'll stop and give time for questions before we move on to the final three sections. Okay, so let us begin by exploring the current context for trustworthy AI. As Roberto said at the beginning, I very much want to see this talk and hope that it's received as sort of connecting some bridges between um, three, broadly speaking, approaches um, to trustworthy AI. Um, because like trustworthy AI, sorry, like human computer interaction, I think trustworthy AI should be understood as a multidisciplinary research program that connects work in ethics, law, with policy and governance, and of course, the technical community. Trustworthy AI in this sense is often seen as something like a catch-all term, which may require further specification into these more fine-grained approaches. And so in order to get some purchase on this kind of wide-ranging and interlocking set of approaches, it helps to sort of look at the role and function they each play. And I think the simplified diagram can help us get some purchase on this. So beginning with values and principles, um, we can think of the role that um, ethical values and also legal values and principles um, playing as sort of a supporting or a motivating role, um, providing some um, ethical and legal guidance which can inform the way in which policy and governance frameworks are developed, introducing certain constraints or certain normative constraints about what poli good policy and good governance ought to do to ensure that the technology that's being designed um, meets and adheres to the values and principles that society deem acceptable. So in this sense, values and principles feed into the types of frameworks that we have seen a lot of policymakers um, and those in governance focusing on. Subsequently then, policy and governance should help um, put these values and principles into the sort of practical frameworks that can be utilized by those in the technical community, whether by setting constraints in the form of regulation or compliance, or indeed, as I've said previously, setting a more positive direction for best practices to help realize some of the opportunities that artificial intelligence can bring in the various domains such as education, employment, industry, and healthcare. And although these can, these can be thought of as constraints, I want to reiterate that I think it's important to acknowledge these constraints can both be negative and positive in useful ways. But then of course, technical guidance looks at how to operationalize um, the values, principles, recommendations, requirements that are put forward by the two previous approaches, showing how the, we can move from um, the more abstract high level principles and values into more domain specific development processes that help um, designers and developers implement the technology in society. And rather than thinking of this as a sort of the end point, as a sort of a linear process that ends in technical guidance, I think it's important to acknowledge that there is indeed a loop here back to the ethical values and principles. This loop can sometimes be thought of in terms of what's known as reflective equilibrium, where the ethical values and principles that we initially put forward can be refined and revised based upon whether or not they meet the demands and challenges of society.
and whether or not, for instance, they are doing the role of helping mitigate some of the risks or unintended consequences of technology. So let's look at each of these three in turn and provide some concrete examples that hopefully can um, make, some, make this a bit more specific. And let's begin with uh, the values and principles. When considering um, values and principles, both ethical values and principles, as well as the legal values and principles, um, there are two um, sort of sources of literature and um, historical developments that are worth citing before we get to AI ethics. Because these both predate AI ethics and are often cited as foundational systems that are refined and extended to meet some of the novel challenges that artificial intelligence propose. So if we begin with bioethics, um, bioethics, for those who may be unfamiliar with it as a, dis uh, as a sort of an area, very much emerged in uh, its sort of more formal and understood sense now in the 1970s from this felt need to have a stable and reflective framework of ethical principles that could allow clinical researchers as well as healthcare pro um, professionals um, who may be engaged in um, clinical trials, human experiments, and of course, healthcare itself, to identify those practices which may be morally questionable or unacceptable. And the four principles that emerged from this kind of felt need for the stable and reflective framework were the a principle of respect for autonomy, a, um, the principle of beneficence, which is to do good, the principle of non-maleficence, which is the converse of doing no harm, and a principle of social justice, which can be thought of in terms of the fairness and the distribution or allocation of resources alongside other things. And these principles provided a sort of a common ground for those in bioethics to look at um, various practices. So they were not merely abstract principles, but very much translated into practical requirements. So for instance, the principle of respect for autonomy translates into requirements that we see now of informed consent, the kind of the model of participatory decision-making between doctors and patients. The principles of beneficence and non-maleficence translate into methods and mechanisms of risk-benefit assessments that senior decision-makers in healthcare organizations like the NHS use to try and determine um, what sort of medication or what treatments they should be bringing into their healthcare systems or trusts. And social justice may translate into requirements for non-discrimination and bias mitigation and participant selection of clinical trials. For instance, um, some, may, some of you may uh, know that there was a, um, a concern that certain painkillers for neuropathic pain were more effective in male um, patients than in female uh, patients because of the fact that clinical trials had largely had a set of participants that were biased towards men rather than women. Of course, these ethical principles also go alongside um, legal principles as well. In Roberto's lecture that started this seminar series, he discussed the role of fundamental values in a modern democracy, noting that the essence of a modern democracy is based upon respect for others, and that this respect is often expressed through our support for fundamental human rights as embodied in the Universal Declaration. The grounding of trustworthy AI in the disc discourse of human rights is, um, like with bioethics, provides a solid grounding in uh, a well-developed uh, um, literature of ju for jurisprudence. But like with bioethics, as we'll see shortly, also raises difficult questions about who is responsible for upholding or ensuring the rights that we can exercise as citizens. After all, rights presuppose duties. If I have a right to something like a right to an explanation under the General Data Protection Regulation, then I, what I'm presupposing is that certain companies or organizations have a duty to uphold um, this, uh, to, to, to meet this right by providing me with a sufficient explanation of why some decision was made by an automated decision-making system. We'll return to this challenge a bit in later parts of the lecture. Moving to AI ethics, um, we, for those of you who are unfamiliar with um, the literature, although it has um, certainly received a lot more attention in the last couple of years, it is important to note that it is grounded in this rich literature of bioethics, human rights, but also computer ethics, philosophy of technology, and other applied ethics disciplines such as professional ethics. <clears throat> 
So for instance, it takes this starting point, say of bioethics, and maybe extends or augments the set of principles to try and address and meet the novel challenges of artificial intelligence. Uh, some recent work has tried to look at whether or not a consensus is emerging in different policy frameworks and has suggested that AI ethics should take the four principles from bioethics but add a further principle of explicability or explainability to try and meet the novel challenge that artificial intelligence systems propose. Some alternatively argue that a principle of explainability or explicability is already contained within the principle of respect for autonomy. Think back to the fact that it is often translated into requirements for informed consent. And we think about what informed means. It sort of presupposes an adequate understanding, which may suggest that explicability is perhaps just merely a component of a respect for autonomy that's already contained in bioethics. The reason I mention this is that it's perhaps worth a short digression before we continue into the role and function that ethical principles play in ethical and moral reasoning about the impacts of artificial intelligence. For those of you who aren't moral philosophers and are not familiar with the debates surrounding the notion of principalism, which is the kind of the belief that ethical principles should guide or steer moral reasoning, it is worth noting that this debate emerged alongside the kind of consensus around the four principles in bioethics in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And some of the advocates of uh, principalism, as in fact it was coined by its um, uh, critics, was that principles, ethical principles, should not be thought of as foundations as such from which all moral reasoning can begin and then move to more sort of specific requirements, but rather that it is merely a starting point to begin thinking about um, what is required to provide ethical justification for certain actions. And alongside this kind of steering role that principles can play, people like Beauchamp and Childress, who are, um, wrote the sort of the textbook on bioethics, note that principles must work alongside other rules, cases that help us understand how these principles and rules are put into practice, and of course the practices that allow us to operationalize it, alongside other virtues that may be society upholds. All of these together form something like a coherent approach to moral reasoning. So it is not that we take principles as foundations, but merely a starting point for engaging in a more um, coherent approach to moral reasoning. There's also, of course, the question, however, that if we begin with abstract principles that should guide us to specify more precise actions or precise decision, practical decision making in particular contexts, that there is the question then of how we choose which way to justify or interpret a particular principle over another. That is, how can we decide if one um, action is more ethically justified than another? And again, defendants of principalism here provide some guidance in the sense that they say additional virtues are added to the mix here to help us understand whether or not a particular specification is more justified than another. And they appeal to other additional virtues such as logical consistency. So is a particular specification leading to an outright contradiction among certain judgments? Is there good argumentative support for a particular action based upon a principle? Can you support it with explicit reasons as to why one strategy is better than another? Is it compatible with non-moral beliefs? Of course, a lot of um, moral reasoning appeals to empirical work such as moral psychology, sociology, behavioral sciences. Is it comprehensive? How good of a, a sort of an action is it in terms of capturing the sort of the legitimacy of other, other similar uh, or neighboring actions? And of course, as well as this, things like simplicity, how good of a rule is it? Is it a simple rule? Is it a difficult rule? Um, does it actually help us in terms of practical decision making? The reason I take this short digression is that by suggesting we need to take a more coherentist approach to the role of values and principles, it would also suggest that we therefore need to look beyond ethical theory and jurisprudence to understand things like trustworthy AI. And this is why I think it's important to think about the other two parts of that early diagram, so policy and governance and technical guidance. Now, as I said at the beginning, I work within the public policy program at the Alan Turing Institute. And um, a short nod here to one of my colleagues' work, and this is David Leslie, who wrote the guide Understanding Artificial Intelligence, Ethics and Safety. Those of you who are not familiar with this work, um, this is in fact the official public sector guidance which was um, given ministerial approval 
um, as a way of shaping and guiding the, um, the sort of the thinking around ethical AI and ethical safe and safe approaches to ethical AI in, in the UK government and public sector organizations. Um, and this is quite an inclusive policy guidance, although it is primarily written for public sector organizations, much of what is contained within it is also relevant for technology companies aiming to develop their own ethical guidelines, um, as well as professional bodies who maybe are considering developing standards, um, such as the IEEE or the British Standards Association, um, as well as researchers across various disciplines who want a starting point um, to understand um, the ethics of AI. Now, while I would encourage everybody to look into this framework and to understand um, sort of the motivation behind its particular approach to ethical principles. So for instance, it doesn't adopt the bioethical principles of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and social justice. Instead, it advocates for fairness, accountability, sustainability, and transparency. That's known as the fast approach. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time looking into this now. The reason being is that I thought it would perhaps be more appropriate to focus on the following report, given that it is more directly uh, involved with trans, uh, trustworthy AI, artificial intelligence. Many of you may be familiar with this. This was put out by the High Level Expert Group on Artificial Intelligence, supported by the European Commission in 2019, and has since been developed and expanded on uh, in, pre in additional white papers. This report on uh, sort of developing ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI has three components, which the group claims should be met throughout the entire life cycle of an artificial intelligence system. So not just its development where people may be, uh, where researchers may be considering or testing different models and trying to validate or train different models, but starting with the ideation stage, whether or not the technology meets a particular problem, a felt problem or felt need by society, all the way through to the implementation and continuous monitoring of the impacts that a technology may have on society. And the report advocates three components um, which should be met. First of all, it should be lawful. This is the technology itself. It should be lawful, complying with all applicable laws and regulations. It should be ethical, ensuring adherence to ethical principles and values. And it should be robust, both from a technical and social perspective, since even with good intentions, AI systems can cause unintentional harm. So this framework comprises these kind of commitments to components, uh, but also um, supports ethical principles. In fact, it adopts four ethical principles very much influenced by bioethics. The difference here is that it collapses beneficence and non-maleficence into a single pr uh, principle of, um, of, of preventing harm. And then it augments this with a principle of explainability. But not remaining content with merely advocating principles, the report um, puts forward seven key requirements, which are here on the right hand, hand of the slide. So the first of these is human agency and oversight, which include um, recognition of fundamental rights um, and human agency and oversight. A requirement for technical robustness and safety, as I've already mentioned, including resilience to attack, so sort of cyber security resilience and data privacy. Privacy and data governance, um, including things like quality and integrity of the data sets, as well as accessibility of data, perhaps to auditors. Transparency, which includes things like traceability of decision making, as well as things like impact assessments and the communication of results. Diversity, non-discrimination and fairness. Here we can see a sort of uh, an exp expansion upon the original um, principle of social justice, which includes the avoidance of unfair bias um, and in, in data sets, but also a, a more um, positive sort of commitment towards universal design and accessibility to refer back to that point I made at the start of the digital divide. The fact is opportunities and risk should be fairly and equally distributed throughout society. Um, societal and environmental well-being, including commitments to sustainability and environmental friendliness, and of course, accountability, which I'll say quite a bit more about towards uh, the second half of, the, of this lecture. To complete the loop, let's have a look at the technical guidance. Um, it would be remiss of me here not to mention the Z inspection, um, which Roberto's um, group are, are carefully considering and putting together. And in fact, Roberto, um, talking about the importance of mechanisms um, for trustworthy AI in his, own, in his own lecture at the start, notes that mere claims by a company developing technological systems 
um, are not going to suffice. So if a technology company, company claims that it should be trusted, these mere claims are not going to be sufficient. Instead, it is up to the technical community alongside ethicists, policymakers, as well as the broader multidisciplinary community to ensure that mechanisms are designed to provide, produce reliable evidence of trust. And when we turn to the critical perspective in the next part of the lecture, we'll look at what it means to produce reliable evidence of trust. But of course, there are other, there are other documents alongside this which sort of demonstrate the, um, the richness of this current uh, program of trustworthy AI. So a recent review of a con by a consortium of researchers from various institutes and organizations called Toward Trustworthy AI Development provide a nice review of some of the mechanisms, um, which we'll have a look at shortly. But of course, this is not just academic institutions and policymakers. Um, private, um, private sector organizations like Google have pr uh, produced their own through the People and AI Research Initiative. They have a guidebook. I'm not gonna say anything about this and I'll leave it to people to decide whether or not this is um, anything more than a PR exercise, but I would recommend actually looking at the guidebook before jumping to conclusions. I'm not going to rehearse any of these particular approaches. Um, each have their own unique flavors. Um, instead, I'd like to look at three themes that I think are common to many of these technical approaches, and that's privacy, fairness, and explainability. Before I do so, I think it's perhaps worth noting that it's a bit unsurprising that these dominant um, areas of focus are those that um, connect with principles that are enshrined in law and therefore place some form of compliance upon technology designers and developers. I'll leave it to the audience to make of that what you will. But let's begin with privacy. So as everybody knows, artificial intelligence relies on vast streams of data, sometimes personal data, sometimes sensitive information, so sen sensitive information as in the case of healthcare. So as such, there's a lot of attention at the moment on the development and assurance of mechanisms for privacy preserving machine learning and artificial intelligence. And there are a range of methods that have been proposed which can be used to hopefully safeguard the data of, uh, of users and the models that are involved in AI development. For instance, people have focused a lot on things like differential privacy, encrypted communication between devices, or even things like federated learning as depicted here in uh, the, the, the picture above um, the privacy head heading. In fact, let's have a quick um, sort of digression into federated learning for those of you who may be unfamiliar with it, although given that I'm speaking primarily to computer scientists, uh, I expect that hopefully many people will be familiar with this already. Um, in a very simple way, so for those of you who are familiar with this, um, note that this is of course a simplistic dis uh, description, we can think of federated learning um, as a technique in machine learning where many devices or clients such as smartphones or computers collaboratively train a machine learning model but under the orchestration and guidance of a central server, so maybe a Google central server. But they do this while keeping the training data for that machine learning model on the device of the client or the user, so the smartphone. It never leaves it. It's stored locally and is not exchanged or transferred. Instead, what federated learning tries to address in terms of its um, response to various privacy concerns is the very need to keep the data local rather than transferring it to a server that may be uh, vulnerable to, um, to hacks, but also to try and respond to user trust, making users feel more comfortable knowing that sens potentially sensitive or personal information is not leaving their device. There are various downsides to this approach, which we're not going to go into now, many of which can be augmented perhaps even by using some of the other mechanisms I referred to, such as differential privacy or encrypted communication. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to worry about the technical details of this here. Instead, returning to the general notion of privacy preserving mechanisms. It's worth noting that although there's a lot of interest, some have stated, including Brandy et al, that's referred to at the bottom of the screen, that there are currently uh, standards are lacking for how to evaluate these new privacy preserving machine learning techniques and people's ability to implement them therefore lies outside of a typical AI developer's skill set. Instead, they recommend that AI developers should start to collaborate and develop, share, and use suites of tools for privacy, machine, privacy preserving machine learning that can help build and include measures of performance against common standards. Moving to fairness, 
Like with some of the other ethical principles we've discussed previously, fairness can mean many things to different people. For instance, we may be interested in looking at the output of a machine learning algorithm and trying to understand fairness here in terms of whether or not the outputs lead to certain forms of discriminatory harm. So whether or not the consequences of an automated decision-making system disparately impact certain groups over others, perhaps say protected or minority groups. But in addition to fairness thought of in terms of discriminatory harm, we can also think of um, um, perhaps a ranking algorithm that rather than causing a discriminatory form of harm perhaps creates something known as a representational harm. So if we think of a, a scoring rule that provides a ranking of different groups but does not necessarily lead to a consequential um, action, people may nevertheless say that it is still unfair if it happens to cause representational harm for some of the groups contained within that list. As the work of Solomon Barakas and his collaborators, um, referenced there at the bottom of the screen, have shown, there are many formal definitions that we can use to help begin operationalizing the concept of fairness based upon the, the sort of the context and demands of the technology we're considering. But nevertheless, despite the fact that there is a lot of interest in formalizing concepts of fairness, this does not overcome the need for the prior ethical reflection and deli deliberation. And to understand why, it's perhaps worth looking at, uh, looking at a case of accuracy considerations. So at the moment, a lot of the focus in fair machine learning has been understanding not just the, um, the overall accuracy of a machine learning algorithm, but the distribution of its accuracy within and between groups. So for instance, a classifier that is listed as 80% accurate, for instance, may be covering up the fact that its inaccuracies are unfairly distributed. So perhaps a classifier is worse for some minority or protected group because of its performance than it is for others. This, is, wasn't, this was in fact the case with the compass algorithm I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture in criminal justice. For those of you who work in AI and in computer science, of course, you will know that there are ways, therefore, to report different error types, which can be derived from a confusion matrix, so false positive rates, false negative rates, false discovery rates, and omission rates, which can provide further information about how such accuracies are distributed across groups. But as you will therefore also probably know, there are trade-offs that must be decided upon as not all of these metrics can be satisfied as, uh, at once because of certain impossibility theorems that have been demonstrated in the literature. And therefore, trying to make this decision is one that is value-laden and requires consideration not only of the system, but its context and the impacted groups. This is, of course, a well-known and well-rehearsed problem in healthcare and other safety-critical domains. Some of you may know it as the smoke detector principle, which refers to the fact that calibration of a smoke detector in one's home should have higher sensitivity or low specificity than higher specificity or lower sensitivity because we want our smoke detectors to go off unnecessarily, i.e. when they're gonna, when there's actually no fire and they're just sort of signaling a nuisance, rather than not going off when there is an actual fire because the latter indicates a potential risk of serious harm, whereas the first, as I pointed out, was a mere nuisance. And these similar trade-offs and value-laden decisions are, of course, um, rife in healthcare, where diagnostic or classif uh, classification models that are used for diagnostic purposes may indeed disproportionately affect certain people because of similar me uh, mechanisms. Finally, explainability. Now, I believe Professor Pekovic covered many of the technical methods for explainability, such as Lyme and Schapp in his previous lecture, so I'm not going to rehearse these methods here. Instead, and sort of in line with that kind of flavor of connecting and uh, creating bridges between different um, approaches, I'd like to instead focus on some of the work that we did at the Turing with citizen juries, one of whom is um, pictured here. And the work that we did try to understand the trade-offs that exist between some of these, um, these mechanisms, such as privacy, fairness, and explainability. Um, for instance, we looked at one of the trade-offs between accuracy and explainability. Um, so for instance, when should we use methods such as deep learning or neural networks, which may in some domains have much higher accuracy than their simpler cousins such as linear regression, but unfortunately as a result perhaps have um, a harder to provide explanations for because of their 
um, they're, they're the sort of lower transparency. And these questions um, are very important to understand in relation to trustworthy AI, because as we found out through these citizen juries, certain domains are more likely to um, skew towards or favor uh, high, levels of, high levels of accuracy, even if it means lower explainability than others. Um, I don't want to necessarily generalize too much from these results. It is, of course, important for individual organizations to repeat these types of stakeholder um, engagements. Um, but in, for instance, we found that um, healthcare versus criminal justice were two very different domains where people will accept some trade-offs of uh, explainability if it leads to greater levels of accuracy, i.e. healthcare, where it's very important for decisions to be accurate. But in cases like criminal justice system, um, where the um, methods, say, of predicting risk are far less objective, people would much rather have greater, uh, higher levels of transparency to ensure that decisions can be explainable to those whose lives may be drastically changed as a result of a, a, a mistaken decision. And purely because it has been released today, I also just want to flag before I end this section and hand over to Roberto for questions, um, some, another piece of work that was published um, in collaboration with the Information Commissioner's Office. For those of you who don't know, the Information Commissioner's Office or the ICO is an independent public sector organization here in the UK whose mission is to uphold information rights uh, in the public interest and promote openness for public bodies um, as well as data privacy for individuals. Um, and the Public Policy Programme have worked with the ICO um, over the last year to develop best practices for explainability. And this is the Project Explain that we've been working on. The link at the bottom of the screen will take you to the report that was published literally today. I'm very happy to see this, this put out. It's taken a lot of work to get there. And what we sort of highlight in this um, report is that it's important to understand requirements for explainability as not mere compliance, right? We don't want this to be simply another exercise in bureaucratic red tape that's telling people what they should not do, but also to set standards of best practice for how companies can um, try and pursue those opportunities of trustworthy and transparent AI, and maybe even start beginning to develop standards and certification measures that can be used across sectors. As I've uh, said with previous reports, it's a little bit beyond the remit of this lecture to go into the details, but we break down explainability into a number of explanation types and then show how these explanation types can be used to develop the type of mechanisms and documentation for assurance that many people within public sector organizations and indeed private sector organizations will find very important for public communication as well as for independent, uh, independent audits. But I will move over to a Q&A um, so that I can drink my tea, which is going cold to the right of me, and hand over to Roberto and take a little bit of a break. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. Um, you succeeded in your first uh, part of the lecture to generate a lot of interest. Fantastic. Which is really, uh, first of all, we have an amazing audience because I have to tell you, I, I've seen some of the people and... Uh, that's really amazing to see how the audience could contribute with values. Let me start, I have many questions, so I don't know if you're able to handle all now, but uh, let I'm me sorry. start. The very first one was from uh, Elena Jones, that was basically asking what countries were involved in setting the foundation of modern bioethics in the 70s? Primarily the US. Um, so there's some, the principles themselves are sometimes known as the Georgetown principles in reference to the university, the Georgetown University, where they were developed. And the reason for this, as I mentioned earlier on, was that there was very much a felt need to have these principles enshrined in, pra uh, in practice. Of course, there are many historical examples where clinical research has um, has gone awry and caused significant harm and social distrust. And this obviously extends well beyond the US. But primarily, the, I think when, when I refer to bioethics emerging in the 1970s, many people within the community would refer back to the work going on at the Georgetown University, 
um, in response to a series of reports that um, I forget the exact name of the commission that was set up, but it was a US commission looking into these sorts of disasters. Uh, a quick Wikipedia or Google search will find, find out what the reports were. I'm afraid I forget them off the top of my head. Um, but of course, subsequently, bioethics and interest in bioethics has very much become a, I don't know if I can use the term global, because it's still, I'd say, probably pretty Western-centric, um, but has certainly become more of a global uh, interest in the, the, the research in the 1970s would have suggested. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I have a question from Nina that basically said, UNESCO has also set up an expert group on AI. Would be good to know, apart from the European Union and the UNESCO one, which other exists, and if there are, collaborating with each other. Yeah. Um, so again, there's probably too many to really sort of uh, to go through this in, in turn. Um, I think, in fact, actually, if, it, if it's all right, I'd like to sort of suggest something else here. And that's that I think the problem at the moment is every time I see a purported global approach to um, AI ethics or sort of sustainable development, when you look at the actual representation of such a global group, it tends to be very developed countries and sort of suggesting almost as if they're the sort of the, the valid approach to ethics and ethical or responsible uses of AI. I won't pick on a particular instance that I saw recently, but it was quite disheartening to see the fact that it was primarily US, UK, EU, and um, a few other very developed Asian countries with very little representation from South America, Africa, and other countries. Um, so I know this is not an exact answer to the question, um, but I would love to see greater forms of collaboration partly just because as a researcher it's exhausting to have to constantly read every single report that's released especially when they cover similar grounds but I would really kind of employ, employ people to spend a lot more time thinking about the representation of the organizations that make up these purported expert groups because um, I think it's a real shame that there's not greater representation at the moment. Yeah thank you. Uh, here's a question from uh, Dionysia Lajo from the European Commission by the way She's referring to the EC trustworthy AI principle and values, and she's asking, does this coherent body of principle and rules ever refers to Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, about the human right of everyone share in scientific advancement and its benefit which in 1966 was included in the Covenant on Economy, Social, and Cultural Rights? Very specific question. Thank you. So I assume by the coherent body of principles that maybe Dionysia is referring to the um, high-level expert group. Please correct me if I'm wrong there, Dionysia. Um, I think here that it's probably useful, again, to refer back to the, the role that principles and requirements play um, and the fact that they're not necessarily sufficient to on their own um, ensure that um, there is a right of everybody to share in scientific advancement and its benefits, but that they certainly don't preclude it. Um, there's lots of very interesting work going on at the moment in terms of what is required to ensure inclusive participation and stakeholder engagement in pro uh, projects that look at the, um, the potential social uh, impacts of artificial intelligence. And it's it's kind of it is it's I, I think it's a positive um change that we are seeing a much greater emphasis not just on responsible what responsible research and innovation means in practice so say a commitment to different principles of what responsible research and innovation looks like highlighting the importance of accessibility for all so that everybody can share and not just share but also contribute to scientific advancement and its benefits so i'd say that um i would i off the top of my head, I don't know exactly how it's spelled out in Article 27, but I would say that the the reference to jurisprudence by many of these principles is certainly compatible with such um, uh, such a motivation, but that it's not sufficient, and that we do need further work in, say, responsible research, innovation, as well as participatory and inclusive design and engagement to ensure that such articles are met. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, we have a question from uh, Thomas Grote that hmm. was one of, you know him, and he was you know, also Thomas one Thomas. of our lecturer in uh, ethics and healthcare. And the question is for you specifically. 
Do you think that the emphasis on policy guidelines in the ethics of AI literature sometimes hinders a deeper understanding of the ethical problems? It's <laughs> a great question. Um, so I'm going to say I'm going to don my hat as a, as a philosopher and an ethicist here. Although I work in public policy, I am first and foremost a, a philosopher and ethicist. It's where my, my academic training lies. Um, there's, of course, I think, a need when communicating with um, diverse sets of organizations to recognize that um, the sort of the theoretical debates and discussions that motivate and interest so many philosophers and ethicists is unfortunately not widely shared. Um, I have, however, been very, um, I've enjoyed speaking with many of the civil servants in the UK who incredibly bright people and um, have a, a sort of a natural disposition towards philosophical theorizing but of course they'll be the first to know that they don't have the formal training that I think philosophers and ethicists do and so of course when it comes to um, sort of setting out um, action guiding principles or action guiding guidelines um, that can be put into practice we do have to recognize that we can't get bogged down in the types of theoretical debates and discussions that go on within the academic um, uh, sort of departments um, but I think nevertheless it is important to be attuned to how those theoretical um, debates are embodied and enacted in the principles and in fact the public sector guidance that um, I referred to that the Turing puts out alongside our set of principles we also have a set of ethical values um, which are very much um, sort of in, sort of connected to the types of philosophical and ethical um, debates that keep us all up at night. Um, and so they're there driving, supporting, underwriting and motivating what we're doing, even if we're not drawing attention to it. So in that sense, Thomas, I think it hinders a deeper understanding of the ethical problems for those outside of ethics. But I think those who are well attuned to these debates should nevertheless be able to see their, the influence shining through the guidance that we put out. Thank you, Christopher. Are you still willing to take two more questions? Yes, of course. Yeah. Because uh, I have more, okay. but I think uh, you should keep on doing your lecture. But anyway, there is a comment that I'm transforming into a question. And uh, the comment is from Ulrike Reisach. And she said, there is a platform which compares the different AI ethics guidelines. And if I'm not mistaken, it is a Chinese platform. Now, let me take this comment and turn it into a question for you. Maybe it's not an easy one. How do you feel about Chinese platform in the context of ethics? I, I, it's hard for me to say without knowing it. Um, I, first thing I would say is, Ulrika, I'd, I'd be very grateful if you could send me that. I'll, I had my email at the beginning, but I'll have it again at the end, and I'd encourage you to um, send me the links if you wouldn't mind, or you can place it in the chat and I can make a note of it before the end of the lecture. Um, I'm searching I, for that. I'm searching you. for that. I have mentioned it in one of my publications, but I'm speaking for it. But the Chinese have had a, an own code, uh, which mm -hmm. was done from the Chinese Academy of Engineering. And they had more or less, it was very similar to the Google uh, um, code, Google, Google's own code, and that was the funny thing that the Chinese seem to learn from our codices too. Right. It'd be interesting to have a proper look into that. I mean, I don't want to say I don't want to sort of speculate too much on something I know next to nothing about. Um, um, I think it's important to sort of. Uh, try to sort of keep our opinions to those that are informed. Um, one thing, one very brief thing I can say um, in support is that I think understanding the sort of the comparative approaches to these types of um, platforms, guidance, whatever it is um, you'd like to refer to, I think are very important. I think it helps shine a light on the differences as well as the commonalities. So I think it's important to try where possible to understand the commonalities and differences. Uh, Crystal, can I dip into this question a bit? Sure, please do. If you don't mind. Um, you're a philosopher and you talk about human rights and fundamental uh, values. Um, what about political systems like China that are not necessarily in line with some of the Western principles of fundamental rights and, and democracy? It's a very difficult question. Um, 
maybe I have. Um, so I think I think it's important to, although this may come across as somewhat idealistic. Of course, there many will say that there are going to be um, conflicts and sources of tension, perhaps between different approaches. But I think, given um, I was going to try and get through this lecture without referring to the global pandemic, but I feel like I've failed at the halfway point. But nevertheless, we are at a point where many of the sort of events that have um, characterized the past sort of decade and certainly the current um, political climate demand a, a sort of a collaborative and global response, um, the, sort of the governance that's required to address many of these problems, not just the pandemic, but also climate change are urgent and global. Um, so I think it's imperative that we look at the current barriers that prevent us from working more collaboratively, inclusively, and in a more of a participatory manner, rather than simply assuming that there's going to be some deep tension at the level of that, the values or principles. I think that's probably suggests a deep a misunderstanding of values and principles. Um, and hopefully my digression into principalism sort of highlighted a little bit of that earlier. And I think it, it, this is something that where moral philosophers need to be clearer. Um, and um, acknowledge that sometimes the nuances of the sort of ethical and philosophical debates are going to be lost in translation, but that if we take a more pragmatic perspective on what the role of moral theorizing should do, it would behoove us to try and consider how we can address some of the barriers that currently exist between cooperation um, and work towards a slightly more um, inclusive and sustainable social good. Thank you, Christopher. It wasn't an easy question, surely. Mm -hmm. uh, let me say the last question so you can move on is from Isabel. How can we safely reconcile public health requirements involving AI devices with sensitive health data privacy protection? And with that, I'm muting myself so then you can continue afterwards. Um, I may, if it's okay, I will please stop me if I don't address this, but I'm going to in the next section talk a little bit about the role that things like transparency, accountability and assurance play. And I think some of what I'll have to say will actually touch upon this question. Um, I will try to remind myself to address the question specifically, um, but I'll just flag that what I'm about to say will I think give us sort of a, an indication of how I, I, I think that question should be answered. But please, if I don't, raise it again towards the end and I'll make sure to give a more explicit um, response. Okay, the question is written down in the comments. I saw, yeah, thank you. I'm right. just, so I'm, I'm, like I said, what I have to say, I hope will answer it. I just, if I get caught up in what I'm talking about and fail to note when and what I'm saying is a response to that question, I will try to make sure I do so again at the end. Okay. Um, so anyway, I'm going to move on to a more critical perspective now. Um, and I would like, again, just to go back to uh, menti.com for a quick little um, sort of uh, quiz for you all. Um, so I'm just going to switch over. And you should hopefully see my screen change now. And I would like you to try your best to answer the following question. Um, do you trust X with your data, where X is Google, Apple, your, your respective university, your bank, and your government? And again, if that's not showing up on the screen, please can someone mention it in the chat, but I hope it has shown up properly. Um, and of course, uh, one here over on the left is definitely not, and five over on the right is completely. And then I'll say a little bit more about why I have asked that question. I'll also repeat, your answers are anonymous, and this is merely a sort of a, an activity. I'm not collecting any data. seems like the answers are sort of converging. I'll just give it a little bit longer. <laughs> 
and it's positive to see that this is broadly what I expected. If menti.com had allowed it, it would also have been very interesting to see whether or not these answers differ um, by different countries or by different di um, disciplinary backgrounds. But as I said, this is not um, this is not me collecting data. This is just to sort of motivate the next point in my talk. So I think that's probably enough. I don't think it's going to change drastically from then on. Um, so um, we also have a distribution here of answers. That's helpful. Um, Okay, so it looks like Apple and Google um, are trusted uh, the least um, and our respective universities and banks are trusted the most and government sort of sitting not quite in the middle, more skewed towards the right hand side towards university and banks, certainly in respect to Google and Apple. Um, so that's interesting and I'll say why in a second. Let me just flick back over to um, the other screen. And we shall continue. So, why did I ask that question? Some of you may have realized that it was a pretty poorly framed question, right? Do you trust X with your data? Not only did I not say what type of data, I didn't say for what purpose the data was being used. And of course, banks and universities and governments may vary quite differently. Um, for instance, you may trust one bank um, a lot more than you trust another bank. You may trust one government, depending upon who is the current leader of the government, less so than if another person was at the helm. Um, the reason I highlighted this, though, is because similar ideas about understanding trust have been explored quite thoroughly by Anora O'Neill, who's a moral philosopher, very notable for her work in bioethics, but also for her um, commitment to public policy in the UK. Um, she's in fact a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. And in 2002, um, O'Neill delivered a series of lectures for the BBC where she explored questions such as, is it true that we have stopped trusting or has untrustworthy action by public organizations made trust too risky um, and is trust obsolete? And she began these lectures by pointing to the, um, the value that public opinion polls about trust play in helping us settle debates, making a very similar point to the one I just made about how public opinion polls typically ask citizens to rank maybe professions to try and find out whether or not people prefer, um, oh, sorry, people trust doctors more so than they trust journalists. Unsurprisingly, people tend to trust doctors more than they trust journalists, at least in the UK. But the fact is, as O'Neill highlights, what really can we infer from these public opinion polls about the nature of trust? For instance, I may trust a doctor when it comes to um, detecting a heart attack, but I probably don't trust the doctor to uphold standards of open and um, responsible communication, as I would say a journalist who's um, working within a free press. Equally, maybe I tr trust one um, politician but maybe i don't trust politicians as a whole again perhaps it depends upon the context in which we are framing these questions so O'Neill sort of casts general doubt upon the value of um, public opinion polls as a sort of a sufficient way of understanding trust instead sort of pointing to the other sort of mechanisms by which trust can be understood and despite the fact that she was writing in 2002, dealing with um, the crisis of accountability that was current uh, at the time facing public sector organisations in the UK, a lot of what she has to say is incredibly salient for the current discussions we are dealing with in today's lecture. And in fact, the book is incredibly short. Um, you can easily read it in a single evening session. Um, and so I'd highly recommend either to get the book or to listen to the audio lectures that she gave, which are available online. It's gonna be impossible to summarize all of her arguments, but I think the useful, uh, the useful, the following quotation is a useful place to start. So Neil argues that there is no complete answer to the old question, who will guard the guardians? Or for those of you who maybe um, have proclivities for graphic novels, who will watch the watchmen? On the contrary, O'Neill argues, trust is needed precisely because all guarantees are incomplete. Instead, we have to think about trust, therefore, as a judgment, and not just look at what trustworthiness means, but where trust itself comes from. And as a result, we need to think of trust as a judgment, 
Therefore, we can think the well-placed trust as an activity for individuals grows out of an active inquiry on behalf of that individual rather than blind acceptance in claims towards trustworthiness. Again, referring back to um, Roberto's point made in his own lecture. Furthermore, a judgment of trust that an individual confers upon um, either another individual or another organization to perform a particular task is not going to be an all or nothing thing. Um, and instead, it is going to be based upon a subjective and perhaps sometimes quantitative, at other times qualitative assessment of the evidence that that individual has for the trustworthiness of the particular person, organization or system. Moving to this kind of relationship between, entrust, between trust and trustworthiness helps us understand some useful points about um, trustworthy AI, providing us with a bit of a grounding for this sort of more critical inquiry. So first of all, if we think of um, this sort of placement of trust and an assessment of trustworthiness as an active inquiry on behalf of the individual, we can then start to assess mechanisms like audits, which have often been put forward by some people saying that independent audits are required to ensure trustworthy AI. After all, this seems like a good approach. Audits can be sort, thought of as a set of tools for interrogating complex processes of artificial intelligence systems, trying to determine, therefore, whether or not a particular organization responsible for developing them are complying with policy or industry standards and regulations. But we can then ask, are these mechanisms of auditing sufficient to ensure that the companies meet their obligations, respect the rights, and develop a culture of trust? or ensure are, is, are they sufficient for, for establishing trust and if so, why? Returning to O'Neill, she says that it's unlikely they're going to be. And instead, what we need to think about is what it means to have intelligent accountability and transparency in order to understand whether or not trust is in fact changing and whether or not it is a result of, our, of systems like artificial intelligence. She's dealing with public sector organizations, but her arguments can transfer quite nicely. What does intelligent accountability and transparency mean? Well, first of all, it's worth noting that in many instances, even if we were to sort of adopt this process of an active inquiry into the evidence of trustworthiness, many individuals are not going to be in a position to do the assessment. Even if we manage to get explainability requirements um, sort of solid and grounded, some people may not have the technical literacy that allows them to inquire. Others may be prevented from doing so because of intellectual property restrictions. Therefore, for many people, they'll have to outsource that judgment of trust to hopefully independent organizations who in turn may rely on standardized mechanisms developed by the communities themselves, so on, so forth. Going back to O'Neill's point about the fact that who is going to watch the watchmen, who is going to do the job of a, a sort of ending at the, at the final point. And the answer she says is there's no point, there's never no end point where we can say that we've got a full guarantee. Instead, she says, intelligent accountability requires more attention to good governance and fewer fantasy, fantasies about total control. Here she's referring to this kind of mistaken belief that we'll ever be able to develop a system of objective interlocking mechanisms that help us automate the demonstration of assurance and trustworthiness for AI systems, and in turn cutting out the need for the active inquiry that responsible citizens should be engaged with and responsible social organizations should uphold for those citizens who are unable to do the job of assurance themselves. But she notes that good governance is only going to be possible, uh, it's possible only of institutions that are allowed some margin for self-governance of a form that she claims is appropriate to their particular tasks within a framework of financial and other reporting. Such reporting, she believes, is not improved by being wholly standardized or relentlessly detailed and since much that has to be accounted for is not easily measured, this job of assurance and accountability cannot be boiled down to a set of stock performance indicators. We'll come back to why this is important in a second, um, specifically the point about this sort of need to try and boil things down to a stock set of performance indicators. But before we do, let's just have a quick look at some of the social conditions in which the various mechanisms for trustworthiness exist and the role that this idea of active inquiry and trust plays in human lives.
A useful, another useful um, work here is the work by uh, Nicholas Luhmann, a German sociologist and systems theorist, who in 1979 in his book Trust and Power noted, trust in the broader sense of confidence in one's expectations is a basic fact of social life. In many situations, of course, man can choose in certain respects whether or not to bestow trust, but a complete absence of trust would prevent him even getting up in the morning. I'd like to draw your attention to two points in this quote. Confidence in one's expectations and whether or not to bestow trust. The latter we've already seen um, highlighted in Anil's work when she talks about the, the sort of the need, uh, the ability of an individual to bestow trust in, in recognition of the trustworthiness or a judgment of trustworthiness in a particular system, person or organization. But to try and start turning towards this human-centered perspective, I'd like to focus more so on this confidence in one's expectations. And I'll do so through a following example. So consider the following. Um, Roberto had kindly requested that everybody be at this lecture at 2 p.m. sharp. Let's imagine I wasn't at this lecture at 2 p.m. sharp. Instead, I turned up at 15 minutes past two. Of course, you would all expect rightfully being a little bit frustrated that I had not turned up on time, that I would give some sort of explanation for why I had turned up late. And perhaps I would offer the following explanation, appealing to certain reasons for my, um, my late behavior and said, I'm very sorry, my phone wasn't working and you rely on my phone to provide me with a little notification telling me you've got 10 minutes before your next appointment. And so because I did not realize my phone stopped working, I carried on eating my lunch, not realizing that I was running late. Now, despite the fact that you would all be a little bit frustrated, me eating into your time and perhaps even having to cut the lecture short because we ran out of time for Q&A, I would hope, given the fact that this was 10, 15 minutes late, that you would go, okay, I'm a little bit frustrated in Chris's behavior, but nevertheless, he's provided an honest explanation for why he is late, and therefore we can forgive him and move on, I would hope anyway. Needless to say, I didn't turn up late, so I don't need to worry about this kind of factual scenario. But now let's think about what would happen if I do another lecture in the future. And let's say the 60 or so participants who are attending this one happen to be the same audience for the next term. And I do the same thing again. I turn up 15 minutes late and I give you the same explanation for my behavior. All of a sudden, I imagine not only will you be frustrated, but you will probably be less likely to trust the reason that I have given for my late behavior. What's going on here? Those who work in a field known as normative folk psychology, who look at the types of reasons that we give to try and make sense of not only our own, our own behavior, but also to communicate our behavior through reasons to other people, say that the act of giving a reason or an explanation does not merely help explain things, but also sets future expectations that regulate our behavior in the future. That is, if I give an explanation, I'm not merely looking backwards to, to account for the behavior of the past. I am also setting up socio-cultural constraints that may be anchored in a particular community, such as the 60 or so participants of this lecture, that will shape the types of reasons I can give in the future. Why have I highlighted this example? The reason being is that I think it draws attention to the fact that trust as it exists between humans is very much um, a complex and conditional upon certain dynamic or historical forms of interaction that allow trust to, to emerge between human individuals. And of course, it is these psychological mechanisms that allow, to hark back to Lumen a second ago, that allow us to get up in the morning because we can rely on each other to fulfill the expectations that we have. But we can't assume that this type of, these types of dynamics are going to be the same types of things we are building into our trustworthy AI systems. Some of you may think it's not needed to, but I, if that's the case, I ask you to consider the following, where perhaps you in, interact with some automated decision-making system based upon some form of AI, and it gives you, on the basis of a decision that you don't like, a particular explanation. Maybe in the same way that I have explained why I was late, you accept it that first time. But now let's imagine we fast forward and you interact with that same AI system again in the future, 
it's giving you the same supposedly objective, rational explanation that you received the first time round. But do you accept it next? Or does it, like a potential person turning up late to a meeting, anger you, despite the fact that it is based upon the same mechanisms the first time round? These mechanisms are automated, but all of a sudden, the sociocultural context has changed. Certain expectations have been set by the first interaction that are no longer being met in the second. The danger here, I think, is that an overly zealous focus on trying to automate many of the mechanisms of requirements for trustworthy AI will overlook many of the important, um, important will overlook the importance of engaging with the type of human factors that underpin this kind of active inquiry that is demanded. Um, for, not just for trust, but also for the ethical principles that we saw served as the preconditions for establishing genuine forms of trust between human users and society more broadly. And so when we think about the current approaches to trustworthy AI, we can think about some of the pros and some of the cons. We have seen so far that one of the pros is that much of what is going on at the moment is a very pragmatic approach to governance, is looking at how not just how we have ethical principles, but how we operationalize and translate these principles into practice, such that more abstract principles that would make a lot of sense in a philosophy or an ethics department can nevertheless be actually put into practice by those who are developing the systems. In addition, it is not merely focusing on mitigating risks, it is also focusing much more on a positive um, aspect of trying to create the best guidance for responsible and inclusive innovation. But I do think there are a couple of problems with the current approaches, not problems that can't be fixed, but things that I think we do need to address. The first of those is that there is a potential risk that if we only focus on trustworthiness in terms of mechanisms, say for privacy preserving machine learning or mechanisms for explainability, that we narrowly focus on things that can be neatly automated and operationalized and formalized. And that's not what trust means to humans. As a result, I think at the moment there is insufficient, not completely, like it's not completely missing, but I think it's insufficient consideration of the human factors that are important for trust. And so with that, I'm gonna to move to the, fine, uh, the, the final um, main section of the talk and look at the relationship between trust and what we can um, infer from work in human computer interaction that maybe helps us find some paths towards developing um, a more human-centered approach. And I'm going to focus on the following phenomena. Some of this may be familiar to some of you who said that you worked in behavioral sciences, um, but also those who said they work in like education, employment, or cognitive neuroscience may find a lot of what's uh, useful here. So um, algorithmic aversion um, is, we can define this as, say, the reluctance of human decision makers to use potentially imperfect algorithms even when there's a demonstrable improvement in performance for a particular task. Uh, the term is often used to refer to cases of joint decision making, so where a human's responsible for some of the, the final decision, but where that decision is going to be aided by an algorithmic tool. So, for instance, like the risk or the need assessment tool that's used in criminal justice, or, say, a doctor who makes the final decision, but is a decision that is motivated or influenced by a diagnostic tool. A recent review by Jason Burton and colleagues um, published this year um, looks at the literature on algorithmic reversion and highlights five themes. Because of time constraints, I want to hand over as much time as I can to q and I'm going to focus only on the first three, um, but I encourage everybody who's interested to look into that paper because it really is a superb paper. The final two, the reason I, I'm skipping those for today's lecture is because they rely um, on more of a sort of prior knowledge of the cognitive and behavioral sciences than I have time to go into. Um, but for those of you in the know, there's some very interesting discussion about ecological rationality, referring to the work of people like Kahneman Sversky, um, Gerd Gigerenza, and much of the embodied or inactive cognitive science work that I think is quite common in cognitive sciences. For those who are interested, therefore, please do have a look at the paper. Um, and if people are really interested, I can try and answer it in Q&A, but just be warned, it will take a fair bit of setting up. Um, so instead, let's have a look at the first three, um, which um, we, uh, we have highlighted on the screen. And let's start with the expectations and expertise, and a sort of a nod back to that 
definition um, by Nicholas Luhmann that highlighted the importance of expectations. So it's important to note that when interacting with AI, each individual is going to bring their own unique prior expectations and expertise to a process of potential joint decision making with this algorithmic system. And these expectations can include things like A, what an, an algorithm can do, B, the beliefs about what an algorithm should do, and C, the varying levels of expertise about how an algorithm functions. The problem that Burton et al draw our attention to is that in each of these cases there's going to be a potential for false expectations to impact how likely an individual is to integrate that algorithmically derived insight into their own judgment or decision making. If, for instance, the prior expectations of the individual are misaligned with the true system's capabilities, it may result in either an under or an over reliance on the actual tool itself. So for instance, if the user does not think that the outputs of an algorithmic system are actually as accurate as their own, they may end up under using a system that is perhaps more, both more reliable and more accurate. And of course, on the alternative side, someone may defer too much responsibility to an inaccurate algorithm. Looking at the literature, um, Burton et al say that the solution or a parcel solution, I should say that each of these solutions addresses one of the themes, but all of them, I guess, are jointly um, sufficient for addressing in their eyes algorithmic, the problem of algorithmic aversion. But the solution to expectation and expertise, they say, is greater levels of algorithmic literacy. So if, for instance, false expectations are the cause of algorithmic aversion, then the solution should be to improve levels of algorithmic literacy. That is, to improve the user's understanding of the basic elements of statistics, logic, and probabilistic reasoning that undergird the rationale of algorithmic outputs. Here, increased algorithmic literacy would result in more accurate expectations, which could in turn reduce unwarranted aversion to well-designed and implemented algorithmic systems, and also serve as a valid defense mechanism against poorly designed algorithms. Next up, we have decision autonomy. Um, we can think of that here as a basic psychological need, which is associated with our need for exercising agency and control in the world, and is fundamental to our motivation and well-being. For those of you who joined Rafael Calvo's lecture at the start of the series, he would have talked quite, I think, a bit about self-determination theory and well-being. And here, decision autonomy um, is a very important component of that, as well as being one of the principles that we saw earlier on in the case of bioethics. The problem that Jason Burton et al. draw our attention to is that there could be a lack of decision control that is underpinning the basis for, an alg for algorithmic aversion. So if feeling a control is a precondition for trust uh, from the user in an algorithmic system, then trust is associated with the user's level of algorithmic literacy, suggesting another reason for improving it. For instance, a user with a high level of algorithmic literacy who does not trust a system may likely have justifiable reasons for their distrust, right? So if I am considered an expert in AI and I develop robots, I, I understand everything about statistics, I should say I don't, but let's pretend I do, um, then it's probably a good reason for my distrust, there's probably a good reason for my distrust. That is, to refer back to O'Neill's point, my judgment in that instance would have been judiciously placed. I would have had good reason for not trusting the system based upon the evidence that was provided to me. But here, trust is not merely affected by the performance, unfortunately, of the algorithmic system. Things like the interface can also impact whether a, uh, a system is, is trusted. Um, the solution here, Burton et al. claim, is to ensure that there is always going to be human in the loop decision making in cases where it's needed. Because providing small adjustments to the interface can in fact afford users the ability to exercise greater levels of agency or control, but they don't necessarily have to impact the overall performance of the algorithm um, offering ways to develop more trust-enhancing um, human-in-the-loop systems. Uh, this is where work in human-computer interaction is very important, showing how slight design tweaks at the level of the, the user experience can be very important for cultivating that feeling of decision autonomy, but can be done so in a way that ensures that the actual performance of the system is not necessarily affected. I'm going to stop very quickly and just have a sip of water. I know people can't see me, so I just want to explain why I haven't why I've stopped talking. Okay. Finally, incentivization. 
so as I'm sure many, everybody has a, their own sort of experience of this, but in many organizations, economic and social incentives drive and impact the types of judgment and decision making that we all engage in. So to think back to 2008, we can, I'm sure of us realize the misaligned financial incentives will promote risky de decisions in investment firms leading to the, the collapse in 2008. It is not merely, I think, uh, the case that people are selfish, but in fact that the environments they work in kind of create these perverse incentives. And these incentives in the case of human computer interaction can increase the likelihood that an individual will use an algorithmic decision support system, but can also diminish the likelihood that the, they will interact with the system. So the problem here that Burton et al. draw our attention to is a lack of incentivization that works in the right way. So while there may be many incentives for using an algorithmic, an algorithmic system, it is important to recognize in some social contexts, there may be factors that act as barriers against these incentives. So for instance, in, and I've found this myself working with public sector organizations, in some cases, uh, a culture of individuals have very strong professional identities, which may be highly resistant to the use of algorithmic systems because they risk undermining professional integrity. So, um, for example, in education, teachers may feel as though their strong professional identity of providing that form of education could be undermined um, by too strong a reliance on algorithmic systems. The solution Burton and I'll bring our attention to is to consider behavioral design as an input more. So early evidence suggests that receipt of information about other people's use of algorithmic systems can have a greater influence on adoption than information about the algorithmic itself. So not merely reporting accuracy or performance metrics, but appealing to whether or not there's good uptake among our peers. So this ability um, to think about whether or not others are utilizing algorithmic systems can help ensure that systems that do have lead to potentially positive impacts um, are adopted by those who may have unjustifiable reasons for being averse to them. Tying this all together to bring this lecture to a close, we can ask what this all means for the human-centered approach to trustworthy AI that began this lecture. And I think this little detour into algorithmic aversion suggests that alongside the consideration of ethical principles and values, alongside the need to consider good governance that people like uh, Anora Neil highlights, as well as the work of um, individual uh, groups like the high-level expert group and the stuff that we've been doing in the Turing, and alongside technical guidance, what all this suggests is that we really need to understand the social cultural conditions that create and give rise to the ability to engage in active inquiry that allows people to judge whether or not um, they have sufficient evidence for trusting a system. So with, in the case of algorithmic aversion, resolving or overcoming algorithmic aversion through the steps that Burton et al. draw attention to can be thought of one way of creating these enabling conditions. They may not be sufficient, however. They may help us overcome some of the problems, but they're not necessarily sufficient for establishing trustworthiness, despite the fact they can be thought of as removing significant sources of friction. There are, of course, other areas that need further investigation. And I again want to highlight the fact that these areas demand multidisciplinary cooperation. For instance, a climate of distrust. We have been exposed, I think, in recent years to the problems of misinformation and disinformation in very tangible and real ways because of their impact on, say, political systems. This climate of tr distrust caused by things like misinformation and disinformation was something that, again, O'Neill drew our attention to back in the case of 2002, obviously not referring to the problems of social media, though she has indeed commented on this subsequently. But again, she draws our attention to the importance that things like intelligent accountability and transparency have. For instance, it's not enough to merely focus on auditing or the producing of more information, because if we're already exposed to um, misinformation and disinformation, why would we trust further information that is given to us if we've already been soured by this kind of climate of distrust? Alternatively, maybe we're just at a point of information overload and that any excessive auditing um, or intelligent transparency, either just bombarding with people, is unlikely to get through to people. And of course, as I've might pointed out already, it is not going to be the, on the onus of the individual to try and determine this for themselves.
And one final thing just to highlight before we turn to the final, uh, the, the concluding remarks, and this is a, a nod to the sociologists here, is that we may also want to consider things like power imbalances. I think we've probably all got experiences or examples from our life where we tend to trust people a lot more if they put themselves into a position of vulnerability because we know that they have um, a potential, they've incurred some risk by exposing some vulnerability. Therefore, the converse of that is that if we know information is coming from people who are exercising or in positions of significant power, we may want to consider whether or not any information or evidence of trustworthiness they give us is going to be well received. Let's end on a slightly more positive note though. So the next steps. As I said halfway through, I was going to leave the discussion of the global pandemic and climate change to the very end, because we are at a time now where good governance must go hand in hand with the urgent governance that is demanded by the types of problems that we are facing. And again, although I'm referring here, of course, to the global pandemic, of course, we also have to acknowledge that there are lots of similarities between the response of governance and policy to the pandemic that can be um, sort of carried over into the response to climate change. I think it's important to consider this, um, these sort of new, um, new sort of facts when we are considering whether or not trustworthy AI can help us with these problems, because if indeed good governance is needed for trustworthy AI, but we are in a place where urgent governance is required, it is going to be very difficult to provide the rapid response that we need while still ensuring trust. I think therefore it requires a very coordinated response, um, which is perhaps in tension with a slow, a comparatively slower pace of, of ethical deliberation, but it is vital that we rise to meet this challenge. Um, and I think this is where building upon the work of different disciplines, different communities, different countries even is vital to addressing this. Recalling the, the opening slides where I emphasize that trustworthy AI is important to realizing the opportunities and as well as risks, I think is also important here. It is not just about mitigating the risks, but we really do need to address these um, problems to ensure that the opportunities are not missed opportunities. And I think it would be a real shame if something as um, ubiquitous and common as human trust gets in the way of ensuring that we can work towards a much more sustainable, inclusive, participatory um, future that um, brings about the type of social well-being that's promised to us by artificial intelligence. I'll end there. Thank you all for your, your sort of uh, patience um, in what was admittedly a very long lecture. Please email me with any queries, follow me on Twitter for updates from the Turing, and I'll hand over again to Roberto for Q&A, and thank you all again. Thank you, Christopher, for the uh, extremely interesting lecture. Um, we do have time for a few questions, so I'll go like backwards from uh, the chat. And uh, let me start with this question here from uh, Elena Jones. I think she's referring to the section on human computer interface. Perhaps people designing HS, HCI systems should include things like video game tutorials. Roberto, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm afraid I can't hear you anymore. Oh, oh are you hearing me now? Christoph? Yes, I can hear you now, Roberto. Oh, excellent. So uh, there was a question from Elena Jones. And she's referring to the section on uh, human computer interface. And she's basically suggesting that maybe one should look at things like video game tutorials. This would allow the user to try and experiment with various inputs to an algorithm and learn what the algorithm tends to output given particular kinds of data. This could endanger and engender trust. What do you think? Um, so if I understand the, the sort of, if I understand the suggestion, um, so a video game tutorial, I guess, is a sort of a series of instructions that familiarize people with the environment and the actions that they can take. And that the, in the case of human computer interaction, this is like a series of steps for how, um, a system can be used. I think I definitely think there's some validity in that. Um, 
I think, again, it's also important, however, to remember the context in which it is implied. So an example that was given to me that highlights this point quite nicely is when um, automated e-passport gates were put into place in Heathrow Airport. And um, initially people were trained on the sort of the systems. They were provided, I guess, something like the, the tutorials that maybe Eileen is referring to. And um, the people that implemented this thought, okay, we've given explanations of how the system should work, that's sufficient. Unfortunately, it turned out that um, upon investigation and follow-up, many individuals were simply bypassing, or being, or being allowed to bypass the e-passport gates being sent to a human because the e-passport gates were rejecting passports without, a, without an explanation. They were just saying, no, not accepting this passport. And it turns out that the people were then sent to the human passport checkers and let through. But upon investigation, it turned out that the reason the passport gates were rejecting many of the passports were for legitimate reasons, such as detecting forgeries or for various other reasons about the individual concerned. But because of the fact that um, insufficient attention had been paid to maybe the high stress situations of working in this environment, or perhaps consideration of the need to explain decisions as well as providing tutorials about how something should work, the initial design of the system hadn't taken into consideration the fact that many ways of sidestepping systems can um, easily be exploited by by users who just maybe don't trust or don't understand how a system should be work uh, should be used. So this is why I think it's important, as I, Eileen suggests, maybe think about having um, better ways of engaging people through something like video game tutorials. But I also think it's very important to understand the culture in which the technology is deployed to try and understand how these technologies may actually be used, but importantly, how may, they may also be misused because of insufficient understanding. Thank you, Christopher. Um, there's another question from Elena Jones that I'd like to read to you. I think she's referring to the uh, slides on power imbalances. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't quite understand how power imbalances could be addressed. How does one design an algorithm or selling suggest an algorithm make themselves vulnerable? Am I asking the right question? So I guess that that's really on the, on the, on the slides where you were mentioning power imbalances and how does it fit into the whole picture here? Yeah. So I, um, I think Eileen is right in raising that question. It's not something I provided an answer for. I merely wanted to draw attention to the fact that it is another feature that's important for understanding human factors. I don't have um, an immediate solution to that, Eileen. I think it's a great question to ask. I just wanted to address that it is a potential source of friction um, that we should also consider when asking whether or not um, evidence of trustworthiness of a system is likely to be well received. I'm not therefore suggesting that um, in cases where there are gross power imbalances have to first of all be ironed out before anybody is likely to trust, but I think it's just important to note that it will provide some force, so, source of tension because of the fact that um, I think trust is often more naturally and easily given in a case where you know that the person who you have to trust is vulnerable in some sense and is therefore unlikely to undermine it. It's not a guarantee, but I think it's just an important consideration that I wanted to add there at the end. Thank you. We have a couple of more questions. One is from Emily. First of all, she said, thank you for a really interesting presentation. I think it's always nice to, to hear that. The issue of power balance seems particularly important for trust, including the power to negotiate the goals and usage for AI. The complexities around AI might exclude many. That's the question now. Do you see the approach in the EU white paper on AI as the right steps on what other steps and what other steps would you see as important? Yeah, so as I mentioned in when discussing the work of O'Neill, it's not, and also the algorithmic aversion point. There will be cases where people will be precluded from making the same types of assessments of um, a system's trustworthiness, if we're judging trustworthiness here as being decomposed into things like um, privacy, um, fairness, or explainability that depend upon quite uh, high levels of technical knowledge, where individuals won't be able to make those assessments. 
And of course, um, as O'Neill pointed out, and as was referred to with my quote about who will watch the watchmen, we recognize this is always going to be the case in society, which is why we appoint supposedly independent um, regulators or auditors to try and do a lot of that on our behalf, because we recognize we can't know everything at once. But it's important to also recognize that we enter into many interactions with people where we aren't in a position to fully um, fully determine something ourselves. A good case here is a doctor-patient relationship. Many people have good levels of trust in their do doctor, despite the fact that we don't have medical degrees and we don't fully understand the pharmaceutical effects of certain drugs on our body. In fact, obviously, I, I assume most GPs probably don't fully understand it themselves. It's a distribution of understanding that we appoint to certain social institutions. Um, so I think what we need to acknowledge is that this is, of, this is a good way of distributing um, the, the sort of this, this type of labor. And I don't think it has to be incompatible with the sort of, sort of commitment to universal accessibility um, or, um, or universal design that I think was being referred to in the question and that I mentioned earlier on at the start because ultimately much of this is a social um, social problem and we can still ensure that the benefits are fairly distributed even if people aren't necessarily able to fully engage in the type of active inquiry. We can think of active inquiry as a sort of something that one person can do, but really I think what's important to note is that active inquiry should really be a citizen level type or a public level uh, active inquiry rather than the onus of every individual to try and determine everything about a particular AI system. Thank you, Christopher. I I'm sure you will be interested in this question because uh, it comes from DMD, so I don't have a full okay. name. Uh, the question is, I tweeted the results of the poll you conducted and I received this very interesting comment to my tweet. I read the, the comment because that it starts becoming a, a, a interesting interaction with people that you didn't even attend your lecture. This is a fascinating, especially the Apple versus Google. Using both, I see a huge difference between the two. I would be fascinated to see more about this. Is it an EU difference or is it an Android versus iOS? Yeah. Um, maybe you could refer it to the general principle of the reason of that, uh, Paul, maybe. Yeah, so I mean, my, my point in doing the poll was not, I should reiterate, I mean, of course you're welcome to tweet things, but um, just to point out that it was not meant to be a scientifically valid poll. I, I was using it more as a sort of uh, an illustrative device to connect up with the point that Anil's making about the sort of the inadequacy of these types of polls. I think it's interesting. I think it's the, the intuitions that people have um, can be illustrative, but I would also question everybody who said that they don't trust Google to wonder why they probably use Google so much, nevertheless. Um, the fact is, is that it was, it was purposefully a poorly specified um, question just to sort of stimulate discussion. But I think despite the fact that it was poorly framed, intentionally poorly framed, um, there's probably a way of looking into that in a much more fine-grained manner that would probably reveal a more nuanced response. Um, I don't know if I want to speculate on the reasons because I think um, it really would just be generalizations that I could offer. Um, nevertheless, I did say it was an expectation I have that people would trust their banks, their universities, more so than Google or, uh, or Apple. Uh, but why people do that? Why people perhaps trust Apple more so than Google? Um, I mean, I tend to trust Apple more than I trust Google, in, 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 interestingly, but I don't know if I fully thought a huge amount about why that is and whether or not I have good reasons for doing that beyond the, the marketing and the PR that Apple provide me with is something that I think is an important question for each of us to ask ourselves. Um, it'd be great to see if a poll, like, like a, a good version of that poll, um, what the results would be, but um, it would require a much more, um, much more scientific format than the sort of the toy example that I gave. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. Oh, by the way, DMD, is well kindly she saying the, the name is Dagmar Monet. So we have thank you for the question, Dagmar. <laughs> so thank you for feedback as well. I'm asking a question myself because um, 
I was very interested in one of your slides where you have the uh, cons. The, oh, uh, the cons, yes. Yeah, you have risk of automating trustworthiness in AI. Um, you am sure familiar that there are certain suggestions from uh, ethical committee, for example, one in Germany here, on labeling a AI product by risk categories. Um, to do that, uh, there's even been a, uh, a proposal recently um, that used labeling influenced by energy consumption and turn it into a labeling for AI, meaning that you classify the AI by risk categories and certain categories are higher risk and certain are less risk in terms of doing harm. And then they put labels with colors like, you know, green, you good, red, you're pretty bad, mm. uh, by areas of indicators. How, how is your feeling? How is your, in, within your uh, entire framework, how would you consider this approach or labeling? Interesting. Um, I'm just actually going through the chat just before I get to answering this question, Roberto, because I just remember there was a question that was asked halfway through that um, I was going to re respond to, and I hope I said something about this when I was talking about O'Neill's work, but maybe I can try and answer both questions here. So O'Neill, when she's talking about the importance of providing evidence for trustworthiness in public sector organizations, highlights the fact that one way in which um, a, a certain response in which this has been done in the past is by trying to develop quantitative or qualitative indicators um, what are sometimes known as key performance indicators or KPIs. And she says that this um, approach is, has many, many issues. It provides a, an easy way for, for organizations to demonstrate assurance. But the fact is, is it often leads to perverse incentives, much like the point I raised about the algorithmic conversion point later towards the end. Perverse incentives can direct behavior in catastrophic ways. So if we know that our, um, if we're being monitored and assessed and we know that um, we are um, being assessed by a very small set of key performance indicators and we find good ways of hacking those kind of key performance indicators such that we find shortcuts where we're not really doing a good job, but we just know that only small parts of our behavior are being monitored, then things can go awry. And O'Neill draws attention to many of those um, in the case of public sector organizations. So to start by answering your question, Roberto, I think these types of indicators or labels are important. They are helpful ways, but they are also blunt instruments and they should not be pursued um, solely as the only means for which individuals can provide accountability. Because after all, accountability, as Anil said, requires a proper account to be given that can be judged by individuals. And the reason I wanted to tie this to Isabel's point about the public health requirements and sensitive health data and privacy protection is that a similar thing here arises with, um, with data privacy or privacy preserving mechanisms and the fact that we may have very narrow ways of understanding um, health data privacy and protection. We have very potentially restrictive rules that prevent us from um, ensuring that AI can actually get access to the data that it needs to, to really bring some benefit. And I think actually many people would probably be more willing to have sensitive information shared so long as they could genuinely guarantee um, that the institutions that are protecting that sensitive health information, even if it is quite a lot of sensitive information that's being um, given over, are trustworthy. I think this is where it's really important. So. There are, of course, public health requirements at the moment um, for the use of sensitive health information. And um, I think it's good that they exist, but at the same time, we don't want that to prevent us from pursuing genuine opportunities purely because our current approach to trustworthiness relies on inadequate indicators as a way of guaranteeing trust, failing to get, get that trust, when actually what we really should do is think a bit more about the intelligent accountability. So just to, sorry, just to finalize that point, I think indicators and these types of labels are important, but they're not sufficient. Thank you. Um, 
I have a question. Well, um, there's a very long comment from uh, Elena Jones, but I'd like to turn it into a question, which is the, the last part of the very long question. You'll see the chat yourself. She's basically asking uh, the relationship between what you were talking about, transparency and trust, and the issue of intellectual property and laws. So, and she's mainly saying that intellectual property might probably be a, a, a hinder to some of the things that you were explaining about trust and transparency. Sorry, I'm just having a look at the chat myself just to try and make sure I can respond to the question properly. So I can imagine that green month is nice and crisp. I think it's right there. There's more than Energy watches. Yeah. Um, I appreciate this is sort of uh, an unsatisfactory response, but I, I think I think it's important to recognize when our own expertise comes up against uh, sort of up against a, um, a topic or an area that we just don't know enough about. And I just don't consider myself to be enough of an expert in intellectual property laws to really offer much of an informative answer. So if it's okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of defer that question. Uh, sorry, defer that question. I just don't know if I can offer anything that's particularly informative at this point. It's it's a it's a good point. It's a good question. I just I feel like I'd need to think about it more. Sorry. Sure. We also have a lecture later on on uh, the legal experts of AI, so that's mm -hmm. perfectly fine. I would say that um, unless there are any urgent uh, questions, I would like to thank our speaker. Thank you, Christopher, for the very interesting lecture. Thank you uh, to everybody in the audience. Um, and we'll put the uh, recording and the copy of the slides online soon. And I wish to everybody uh, not only a good day, but also to stay safe and healthy, especially in these days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again for inviting me and for everybody to, um, for, for listening. It's been great fun. Thank you, Christopher. Bye. Okay.